we wanted to be in inclusive and um, and sort of give everyone a more comprehensive view of what the funny landscape looks like for um, uh, for the uh, um, uh, research space. Uh, ORI has a uh, has, has a history of sort of being very, very um, um, generalized in terms of what it'll fund and our, um, our grants tend to be smaller and shorter. So um, if, with that said, let me, um, let me welcome everyone again. Thank you for joining us. And um, um, the, um, so I wanna thank everyone for joining us. And I think we know who everyone is now. And, but I do want to point out that uh, Dr. Lauer needs to leave early, so we're going to sort of focus a little bit on, on him uh, to begin with, and, um, and then we'll, we'll move to the, the rest of the panel. So, um, so uh, Dr. Lauer, I want to start with you, knowing that you are a um, clinician by training. Um, I was one, and, and by training, I'm, I'm a, I guess, a public health uh, uh, Professional, so I'm. I'm. Uh, you're. You're trained in treatment. I'm trained in prevention. Uh, I'm going to skew a little bit towards prevention here with my question. Uh, so, I, wearing both a hat as a as a clinician and as a funder, um, what are your what are your thoughts on um, on, on prevention of misconduct? Is is this something that um, is uh, a a funder responsibility? Is this um, is this on institution? What 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 are your thoughts on that, and 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 um, why? Uh, you know, where, where's uh, give us a little bit of background of that. Uh, so Ben, it's an interesting metaphor. I, I sometimes think of the work, the integrity work that we do, as being very clinical. Um, I uh, you know I hear a chief complaint. Um, I uh, we take a history, uh, we gather data, we bring in consultants, uh, we attempt to remedy. Uh, sometimes the remedies work, and sometimes they don't. Um, so, in, in, uh, and, and actually, I'm not saying this tongue in cheek. I've actually, you know, read some interesting literature about this, about um, executives who, um, who have uh, backgrounds as clinicians, um, that the, the kinds of skills and the kind of thinking that they learned um, as part of their clinical training uh, lent itself very well um, to dealing with the kinds of problems that executives have to deal with. And, and I think these kinds of problems, integrity and compliance problems, um, a clinical mindset can sometimes be um, extraordinarily helpful. Uh, I do refer to cases as cases, and I, um, I sometimes think of uh, when, we, when we get together on a regular basis to discuss our cases, I think of them as going on rounds. Um, uh, so, okay, uh, but you are absolutely right that, um, that uh, you know, the, um, the clinical approach alone is, is not, uh, not going to completely solve the problem. And in part, that's uh, what we were talking about this morning, that uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not only dealing with the specific um, illnesses uh, when they come up, but it's also trying to figure out ways to prevent them. Uh, and whose responsibility is it? It's everybody's responsibility. That's why we're all here today. Um, that's why, for example, the ORI roundtable yesterday was a combination of uh, ORI, the um, uh, funding uh, uh, funding officials and uh, officials from from universities. So um, th this is something that that uh, that we all own. But I, I think it is clear that you know creating a a, a culture, measuring that culture, uh, creating uh, both incentives and disincentives. Um, is a good thing to do. Um, and while we're never going to be able to totally eliminate uh, misconduct, uh, we want to make it as difficult as possible. Um, we want to uh, minimize the damage um, that it causes. Um, and uh, we, we want to create um, a, um, an, an environment in which people, new scientists in, uh, who are coming in, um, from the very beginning are thinking, uh, uh, above all, I, I have to be honest and I have to play by the rules. Um, and uh, uh, e even if my science is not going to be all that successful, I, I need to be able to look at myself in the mirror and say that as best as I could, I did things right and, and, um, and I told the truth and, um, and, and I acted at the highest levels of integrity. And if you can say that, you can be very proud. Okay. Um, so uh, here, here's a, uh, I, and, and I, I um... I, I hope that culture um, is something that we that we uh, uh, come back to. I'm sort of planning on coming back to culture a little bit. I think uh, it goes back to was it uh, um, 
um, was it uh, see, do, train? I guess coming back to the, um, I, I might be butchering that that cycle, but in clinician training, there I see a lot of uh, similarities there as well. Um, that that you're that see one, do one, teach one. Except that's exactly. not really true. But yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the idea being that the pr the prior generation uh, trains the next generation not just in how to do, but not just in what to do, but how to do it. So I'm thinking in terms of sound science. Um, but so in our, in our first question, then I, after this, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, uh, pitch it to you. And then I'd let, if the rest of the panel like to, to weigh in as well is, um, and this, this uh, sort of uh, builds on your earlier comments, uh, closing comments um, uh, of your uh, prior talk, but um, it's, it's talking about whistleblowers because uh, the Duke case and um, Duke case and some of those other cases involved whistleblowers, and uh, it led to um, substantial um, uh, incentives for for uh, universities to uh, um, to make changes to um, training and awareness and misconduct at those universities. So, um, do you think that um, funders should? Play, Funders should take a more direct role in uh, determining in, in deterring uh, misconduct in universities. Or do you think it's something that, you know, as as you're speaking, you know, the the university uh, there's the the funder university scientist. Do you think that maybe it's it's more in the university to to um, to take that role? I'm, well, I, yeah, I I think it's both of us. And I, part part of the the rationale behind uh, putting out that guide notice a while back um, about the importance of institutions speaking to us about misconduct concerns um, is that uh, this is um, a matter of in which the funding agencies clearly have an interest. Um, it looks really bad for the entire enterprise when it's discovered that there has been a problem, and during all the time that that. Uh, people were aware of the fact that there was a possible problem, the checks kept flowing um, and nobody was, was, was um, you know, thinking about it. Um, and uh, that it does not make, it does not make the enterprise as all look well. And that, you know, th that has worked well. I know there were concerns early on about, about confidentiality and, and, uh, um, but what has happened is, is that uh, there has been a lot more communication now between institutions and, um, and NIH. Um, on misconduct concerns. I, I think another part of this is that um, we, we um, are taking uh, misconduct concerns seriously. So not, not only scientific misconduct, but like, for example, this morning I talked about peer review misconduct. When we identify peer review misconduct, we are now um, getting into conversations with, uh, with um, institutional leaders and saying, hey, these are your employees and this is what they're doing. Um, and uh, you know, we need to talk about this because this raises questions about, first of all, do, do your staff appreciate how peer review is supposed to be conducted? Um, but also uh, it raises questions about the integrity and trustworthiness of this particular person as a steward of federal funds. So let's have that conversation. It, it can be a rather uncomfortable conversation, but it, it's an important one. Uh, and it's just another part of fostering that culture of accountability and integrity. Uh, if, if I could, uh, Wanda, can I, can I um, uh, essentially pose the same question to you? I, I think uh, NIH and NSF uh, have uh, complement, possibly complementary or parallel efforts in terms of uh, um, accountability around um, uh, uh, subjects other than FFP, such as I'm thinking uh, sexual harassment, for example, um, other misconduct. Um, uh, so I, I was wondering what, what your thoughts are as well. Yeah, and thank you, Ben. And thank you, Michael. That, um, as some of you may know or may not know, NSF has taken a very different role than NIH in terms of integrity training. And if you have funding from us, they ask that all your grad students or undergrads or postdocs do responsible conduct or research training. And they really leave it to the universities to do the training. And I have had many conversations with both um, PIs and people who do ethics research, you know, to say, why doesn't NSF take a stronger um, role in policing or in, you know, 
uh, more heavy handed, more like NIH. And the, the official NSF response is that we have an office of um, the inspector general that does take complaints and does the research and that's a separate wing. Whereas where I am at, it's in funding research that gives us the best practice and is informing so that we can do better responsible conduct of research training. So that's kind of the bigger issue um, without getting, and if I missed some of the smaller questions, please ask it again. Uh, well, um, I, I guess that the, the, the question, so you're, you're saying in terms of um, the, the um, kind, of, kind of putting on the, on the um, institution, um, I, there, there's a question in the chat, in chat, which I think sort of uh, goes to this a little bit, um, about PIs do not get training and how to do RCR training for their students, or not even advice. And, and, and I, I know a little bit about uh, how, you know, uh, um, the NIH side because of our um, um, ORI's relationship to, um, to NIH and RCR education. Um, so I, I may, maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit about how NSF does that and um, more, more broadly um, uh, speaking, I, I wonder uh, in terms of um, how this actually fits into when we're speaking of academic I guess maybe this is a little bit of digression, but it's interesting. It, it, it reminds me, uh, the first thing I thought of is was on day one of faculty training or, or day one as a, as a faculty, no one actually teaches you anything about teaching. You, you get a lot of training on, on, on research and how you're gonna do all that, but you, you're, you're assigned classes that you're supposed to teach, but no one ever tells it says a word to you about how to teach. So um, I, I, I uh, you know, that's maybe just a, a thought to yeah. that, that that's sort of endemic to the to the uh, academic enterprise. But uh, um, yeah. If, you know, yeah, yeah. and the um, and Michael had already referred to that we're all responsible and we all need to be engaged, and it takes a community. And it's going back to the idea of creating a culture where we reinforce each other for good behavior. And the question is, how best do we do that? And that there are many obviously different strategies of whether, you know, very direct policing or leaving it open for different disciplines or different universities or organizations to define their own culture or how did we do it? And NSF has, um, in terms of policy, has taken the more open-ended. However, the conversation about, especially getting PIs training is one that is, um, it comes up again and again, and because obviously NSF's official policy is, you know, students and postdocs, those that are training. However, I think if universities came to NSF and all said, we really want you to have a stronger policy where all PIs need to be trained or help us to figure this out, NSF would be, I suspect, and I, I can't speak for that, um, you know, my superiors, but as an academic, as a researcher, as a program officer who funds research to think about the cultures of ethics that the, would open up the conversation. And it, but it has to come, I think, from the institutions. NSF has taken the policy of, we will respond to requests from the community, but we are not going to over-police our community on the responsible conduct of research. And that's just as I understand the policy. Now, whether it's, you know, whether that's perfect, hey, we as researchers, we get to do the research and have that discussion. But I think it is a really important issue of where are PIs getting their training and what is reinforcing their cultures of ethics and um, responsible conduct of research. Okay, um, I, I, I don't want um, I don't want Matt to be uh, to be uh, left out. Uh, um, I, I'm trying to save a little bit of of um, of uh, time once uh, Mike departs for Matt to talk a little bit about the funding model uh, that DARPA has. But um, uh, I, I'm not not sure if I if I can sort of um, you know how uh, you know what how how you want to weigh in on on this as as a you know, as a civilian or as a, someone who's gone through actually 
um, I should point out, I was going to say, as just going, having been a student, and uh, I realized that everyone has um, a, a, a connection to RPI in one way or another on this, on this panel. And um, it was unintentional. It's, it's uh, very interesting. Um, nonetheless, um, th this should be in your alumni literature. Uh, very, I think, a very prestigious panel. And, and uh, we're, 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 we owe a lot of thanks to RPI for, uh, <laughs> uh, for having you. Uh, but so, so Matt, do, do you have what? What are your um, what are your thoughts? I, I'm wondering in terms of communication. I think I think maybe this this goes to what, what Mike was saying earlier. Say now, when does saying there, there's uh, communication seems really important. And um, what what are what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I I I think I agree with a, a lot of what's been articulated. I think the responsibility is on both sides. So the you know the institutions performing the research. Uh, certainly the, you know, whether that's an academic institution, DARPA also uh, uh, funds commercial companies, uh, industrial companies to do research. So, uh, you know, I think they uh, need to take ownership for it, but uh, I think also the funding institutions as well. Um, it occurred to me hearing some of the, the comments, like I don't, uh, I am not aware that DARPA imposes, uh, let's say uh, responsible conduct of research training. Uh, that uh, that NSF and others might. So that's uh, that was kind of an interesting uh, takeaway for me. One thing that we do do that's probably different, uh, you know, certainly on a lot of programs, we run our own independent evaluation. So like I actually pay a team to create an evaluation, take software components, for instance, from other uh, from other researchers and test and evaluate it. Um, I don't know that that's a model that's going to work everywhere, uh, but that allows us to make our own independent assessment too of the research progress, which is a which is a useful thing. So it's not just about you know publishing a paper in a in a journal or getting it published at a conference. We also make our own independent assessments. Um, okay, go ahead, Mike. No, I'm just very curious. Then, so um, at, at DARPA, if you if you if you hear concerns about. Um, something about the integrity of the work, how do you, how do you approach that? Yeah, I, so as a program manager, I haven't uh, fortunately had to deal with that myself yet. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in general, uh, you know, we have regular uh, review meetings with performers. So, you know, I'm talking, performers are the folks that we're paying to do research. So that's a little bit of DARPA speak, um, but you'll probably hear, hear me say it multiple times. Uh, I do regular reviews with them, might be every two months, might be every month. Uh, there are some researchers I'm talking with every two weeks um, and seeing the results. And then in addition to that, again, we're running these large scale evaluations. That gives me a sort of an independent way to assess. And it's not just, hey, we got this paper published. Um, and again, I don't know that that's a model that's gonna work for all institutions. And I don't know that it works for all problem domains. I mean, I'm funding research in computer science. That's, uh, uh, you know, that may allow us to do things that, you know, biological sciences, it, it just might not be as, uh, as easy to do. Um, so, you know, I guess, hypothetically speaking, there, you know, there would certainly be opportunities for me to talk directly with performers to try and uh, to try and get at the bottom of those issues uh, and, and have those uh, those sorts of hard conversations. Uh, we do it all the time, just as part of the normal management of uh, of our contracts, not necessarily deal with um, uh, with questions about integrity of the research, but uh, certainly measure and evaluate and, and uh, weigh the uh, their performance. You know, I I I see that there that there is a, a common theme um, in terms of, uh, and, and and this is as you're talking about scalability, and I think that this actually in turn is is a uh, you know is a problem to be to be solved in terms of um, uh, really when, once you look under the hood, uh, we're, we're talking about Neil Pot, the Neil Potty case. Once you start looking under the hood of of findings. Um, you that that's where problems come to light and uh, or potential problems come to light and um i think uh nih's uh data sharing policy uh, will will sort of help uh accomplish that and i i'm wondering um wanda it can um what what are um 
how does um, how does an NSF approach uh, or, or or where are you going in terms of uh, in terms of data sharing? And I I, I know on the one hand uh, DARPA deals with primarily it seems like pri proprietary um, information, and um, and then NIH uh, is is moving towards uh, you know the all of us model for for data as well. And so where where does uh, NSF um, fall in that uh, continuum? And the NSF requires a data management plan, which part of that is a description on how will this data be publicly accessible. And depending on the particular norms in the discipline, sometimes how that is played out, i.e., you know, for particularly, I think it's more the qualitative data that is still being worked out by some of the, at least social scientists, some of the data sets are, you know, have a home and they're easier to reference, but we really trust the community that as the practices are evolving on data sharing, that the current proposals reflect those practices and abide by best practices. Okay. Um, and I, I'm, I'm being um, conscious of, of the time. I, I know that, uh, that uh, Mike needs to leave in a few minutes and I, I just want to 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 just kind of give a, a couple minutes um, uh, to see if if there's anything. Um, actually, there were, I have a whole list of things from your uh, uh, closing um, closing comments that I want that I want to follow up on. I was wondering if, if there was if there's any any um, um, more uh, any if, whether you want to get more specific or you want to talk a little more generally about where where you see. Um, or how you see the role of the funder relative to this, you know, and anything, anything I'm, I'm giving you the floor. Um, at, at thanks, uh, thanks, Ben, and I, I apologize. Uh, one of the advantages of Zoom is, is that you can go to multiple t places in, in, in a single day, and one of the disadvantages of Zoom is that you can go to multiple places in a single day. Um, but I, I want to follow up on Wendy's comments, because I, I think, uh, you know, what NSF has done in uh, data sharing, data management plans has, has been absolutely spot on. And, and we're in the bio, biomedical community, we've been behind on, on that one. Uh, we are now um, rolling out a policy, uh, which is very much in the same spirit, which is that um, all applications will have to come in with a data, sh uh, data management sharing plan. And uh, there's um, a lot of uh, parameters about what, what exactly that means and what, what we're looking for. But the, the default is, that uh, the data will be shared. And in fact, in the 21st Century Cures Act that was passed in 2016, uh, there was a specific provision there that gave the NIH director the authority to require data sharing uh, for all NIH funded research. That was a very big deal. Um, so this meant that uh, we couldn't, um, we, we, we weren't saying this simply because we thought it was a good idea. We actually had force of, of statute um, behind us uh, to, uh, to make, uh, make this requirement. I think that uh, you know, making um, data av available uh, can only be a good thing and uh, can only help to um, enhance integrity. Um, you know, I've been doing research now. Well, I, I do very little research anymore, but from the time when I did do research um, over, uh, over, over a span of decades, you know, we've gone from a time where uh, we would never share data and never share code to now where the, this is the expectation. And in fact, I, I am working on a paper right now, and I know that my that the data will be shared and the code will be shared. And I'm I'm looking forward to this. I'm making sure that the code is extremely well annotated so that whoever reads it will understand uh, what we were thinking. They, they may think we were thinking wrong, but at least they'll see what we were thinking. Um, and. Uh, uh, and I, I would think that this would only, you know, this sense that you know that other people, particularly skeptical people, are going to be looking at your data and looking at your code and looking at your, 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 your methods in great detail should only help to um, enhance um, uh, a culture of honesty and integrity. Maybe that is Pollyanna-ish, but I, 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 would, I would hope that that would be the case. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry I can't stay on for the rest of the uh, of the discussion, but I want to congratulate all of you. It's a terrific conference, and you're all asking the right questions, and uh, we're we're all doing um, our part to uh, keep the research enterprise uh, honest and and successful. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it.
Okay. Um, so uh, I, I think that it was almost almost like it was planned. I I, I don't want to I, I don't want to take credit where credit is not due, but um, th this is is uh, is a great is a great opportunity to um, um, I'm going to pitch to Wenda for for a few minutes to sort of high to highlight NSF. I think um, uh, Matt will also follow talking a little bit about the funding processes because. Uh, at at DARPA, because part of uh, of the this panel is not only to talk about where these funders um, are going, but also how to, you know, some of the mechanics of of um, the fund uh, of funding. So, um, uh, I just um, I send it over to you, Wenda, and then um, we'll uh, we'll um, pick right up with um with uh, the question. Actually, while while Wendy's doing that, let me let me um, uh, provide a little more in depth uh, introduction. So so you'll start. So so we'll um, um, you'll know where she's coming from in her background. I I I realized we did that for for Dr. Lau. We did it for Dr. Turek, but uh, not for Dr. Bashby. So uh, she is a social scientist specializing specializing in science, technology, and gender um, in West Africa from a cultural perspective. Her research interests include women in schooling, everyday technologies, water and electricity, and adaptations and adoption, adoptions of agricultural innovations. Um, her own institution is Michigan State University, where she is a, a co-director for international research and engagement for the Center for Gender in a Global Context. I think it's called GenSen, if I if I recall my um, if I recall properly. Um, uh, currently, she is a program director for the National Science Foundation for NSF for the Ethical and Responsible Research Program and Science and Technology Studies Program. And um, actually, this is her, I believe, her second tour as, uh, as a, uh, in that role, uh, having previously filled that role, I believe, from 2015 to 2017. So uh, it'll, it'll be interesting if, if, uh, if you want to... Um, at any point, note how things might have might have changed in in that time. It seems like, uh, particularly when we're talking about technology, um, and uh, it, it's interesting how quickly things can change. So I I uh, I wonder if if uh, your perspective, if how how you're uh, um, how you're adjusting to the to uh, 2021 <laughs> in your in your role. So please go ahead. Thank you, Ben, and thank everybody for being here and. That if you do have questions, if maybe if they're put in the chat and we can um, look at them later. And yes, I actually do have a slight historical perspective to give you. Um, but first, I just want to introduce NSF. I really like this slide, even though I uh, need to update it for 2021. But the NSF compared to um, especially our sister NIH, we have a much smaller budget. But 95 to 98% of the money that comes in goes out in grants. So I think we're pretty efficient and I kind of like that statistic. The other thing is that's also important for the program, which I oversee the ethical and responsible research, is that NSF has eight directorates. And all direct all eight directorates are involved in E8, and ER2 is our nickname for it. So ethical and responsible research. So whether you work in the biological sciences, the geosciences, and engineering. That if you do are thinking about the ethical culture and factors that influence the practice of ethics in those communities, this funding mechanism called ethical and responsible research will um, be interested in your projects. Anything that NSF funds, we are interested in. And Ben had mentioned the history, um, and this I. I really like to look back at how this program has changed. It's on its third name since 2005. So it's not very old, but it keeps changing its name. But that name reflects the changing, um, I think, both academic, scholarly, and professional needs of the community. So it started out with only five directorates, really focused on undergraduate education. It slowly added directorates, and by the time it changed its name in 2014, it had eight directorates, and it recognized it needed to move beyond just simply thinking about undergraduate education, but to think about graduate education, and also to think about institutional transformation. 
and it added at that point, as well as standard research grants, a grant to do an institutional transformation, i.e. if a college at a university really wants to do something innovative to up the notch of their culture on doing um, in research with integrity, and they've got some neat ideas, they can put together a proposal. So in 2019, the name got changed to Ethical and Responsible Research. Again, it's still now at all eight directorates, but you see the funding, funding has basically doubled since it was first um, initiated in 2005. Plus we now welcome conference proposals. So if you have an idea and wanna think about putting together a small research or a small workshop to think about some of these research issues in your discipline, we welcome that as well as an incubator um, proposal. If you want to test out, test out working with some other institutions in your state or even across the country in some innovative, slightly risky idea, we're also really encouraging you if you're working with one of the 700 plus um, minority serving institutions to think about doing an incubator proposal to explore a new partnership on obviously ethics and responsible research. So what is the program, what's its focus, what's its interest in, and that it's really, it's looking for what are the factors that promote ethical STEM practices in whatever discipline of STEM you're working in, what might be techniques, best practices to ensure that that ethical STEM is cultivated, maintained, reproduced, and sustained. You could be looking at honor codes, ethic training programs, professional ethics code, laboratory cultures, factory mentoring activities, any gaps in our knowledge that will help us to develop best practices to improve the training of both ourselves and of our students this program is interested in. Potential questions or types of questions or big questions that you can have smaller questions that answer is again, really focusing on what are cultural and institutional contexts that promote ethical STEM, why? And why might certain labs or universities be stronger in, in supporting cultures of academic integrity than others? And what practices are contributing to the established maintenance, and as I said, sustainability, reproducibility of ethical training, i.e. somebody's trained in one place, they go somewhere else, they continue a certain ethical culture, what is it that's, that's happening? So any of those or other questions within that we welcome. So those are just big questions to get you thinking. I've already mentioned that we fund standard research grants, we have conference and workshop um, proposals, incubator projects, which are to be collaborative, and an institutional transformation grant. That all NSF goes through merit review, and this program honors and follows the NSF merit review criteria that get broken down into the five questions of advancing knowledge, benefiting society, being potentially transformative, you know, with a good work plan, good methodology, well-qualified team, um, and the right resources. So if you wanna see what we have funded recently on NSF, you can search the awards. It's my shortcut to you is put in the program ele element code one, 29Y, and that will show you everything that the ethical and responsible research has funded since 2019. If you're new to NSF, that as well as reading the solicitation very carefully, you want to follow the proposal and award policies and procedures guide. And this will give you an answer most of your basic questions and even more sophisticated questions about how to put your grant together, your proposal together and what to do after you've received one. I put in the chat, the online ethics center, that this was a NSF funded program that has now moved to the um, University of Virginia. Um, Roz Byrne is the director. 
they have a new web page that just launched with resource collections, events, and one of the new things that Roz is doing is communities of practice. And she is looking to expand this. And so if you have suggestions, ideas, or way to participate, please reach out to the Online Ethics Center because it is a repository, a resource for whether you're teaching ethical research or ethical um, conduct for research or whether you just need some support or ideas yourself. And the NSF, as I mentioned in the chat earlier, that this is what I've talked to you about is a specific program aimed to fill in the knowledge gaps about responsible conduct of research. But we also have our own responsible and ethical conduct of research policies, and there's a website for that, as well as the Office of Inspector General, where reports of research integrity or fraud are submitted. And so with that, I thank you. All right, th thank you, Wenda, for, for that um, overview of how, um, for educating our crowd on, um, on NSF and, and also how to, um, um, all the funding options available. Uh, the, given your background in, in culture and also the, those last couple questions that, that are, are there, um, I, I was I just wanted to uh, really sort of ask uh, what, what your thoughts are as someone, again, with a historical perspective and, uh, and also the perspective as an uh, academic and also as a, as a Fed. Um, uh, what, what, what is, is, is the role or, um, or really what are your thoughts on the role um, of culture and also in, in, in the transmission of culture in, um, in, in research integrity or, or, or promoting research integrity or um, say preventing research misconduct? And I'm, I'm, I'm curious what, what, your, uh, what your thoughts are from as, as an expert in culture. Yeah. And the, of course, because I am an expert in culture, I'm a sociologist, I'm, a, I'm an interdisciplinary social scientist, but to me, it always comes back to culture. So obviously my answer is going to be the culture is super important. And, but obviously it, your question Ben is, is more nuanced than that. And one of the things that we know is that when we put attention to, we put resources to, we talk about it, we focus on it, that we can take an issue that may be invisible in the culture and bring it to the surface and change the perspective on it. So that, and I think that that's been happening in the research community for ethics and um, in, um, responsible research. But I, what I, and excuse me, one of the reasons I really wanted to show how it's changed at NSF in the last 20 some years is that the emphasis, emphasis the attention, the progress, it's growing. So there is a recognition that the culture and thinking about integrity, thinking about um, misconduct in science, thinking about how do we be the best researchers we can to benefit society is in the culture, it's percolating and it's, and it's gaining steam. And that it only can happen it, though if we as a community continue to ask those questions to do our part in pushing the institutions and the culture to address these issues. Because the minute we say, oh, we figured out how to be ethical and to do really good research, then it's gonna fall by the wayside. So that's one of the exhausting parts, I think, of, of lessons learned of having worked in, um, in thinking about the role of values and ethics in the development of knowledge production is that it's a never ending process that we have to stay vigilant and can't think, oh, it's done, wow, we conquered that, now we can move on. No, we've got to always be putting it on the table, remembering that we need to have questions to both prod ourselves, our culture, and the work that we're doing to think about, okay, how could I make this project more ethical? Or what are the invisible ethical issues that I haven't thought about yet? Or, you know, who are we, do we all mean the same thing by the word ethics? What values are dominating in our conversations? 
what's hidden, what's assumed, and to be constantly be vigilant, vigilant in asking those questions. Great, thank you. Um, actually, I'm I'm going to put something in chat, and maybe um, uh, let's say I can bring it up as well. And this this is to transition from from the institutional culture to maybe the the broader culture. I'm going to pitch this to to Matt and and. I think from there also maybe tell us a little bit about how DARPA funds projects. Um, the, to me at least, this um, um, my hair, this um, um, uh, this this new innovation, which apparently according to to the spam from Genie that I got, uh, has been used fifty five million times, um, of animating. Essentially, it, at at what point? Or do you see, or what are your thoughts on on uh, essentially um, uh, this? To me, it sounds like um, they're um, a genie or my or my telling deep fakes. And uh, <laughs> um, what what uh, do do you see that maybe um, as as the cultural acceptability or cultural demand uh, drives commercial interests and commercial interests, as you're saying. Is 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 sort of leading innovation. What? How, how do you how do you see? It seems like there's a there's a push pull in in that. While we we want um, essentially manipulated media, we don't want manipulated media. And 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 how, what kind of challenges does that does that pose for for you as a as a funder? And um, how how do you you know? And what what are your thoughts on 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 this? I'd say sort of push pull. Yeah, great. Um, I mean, it's uh, it's going to be challenging times, I think, for a while. There's a there's a phrase that I like that uh, that folks in the UK, researchers in the UK, and in sort of this broader space of disinformation or information security use, which is uh, epistemic security, right? So we want to have security in our knowledge and our understanding. That certainly includes the scientific process. You know the discovery, innovation, reduction to practice, uh, commercialization of, of technologies. Um, you know, there's uh, again machine learning uh, community. Uh, other commercial interests are driving the ability to create uh, manipulated media uh, or to sort of synthetically create media. There are certainly positive use cases. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for the opportunity for when I can watch Netflix and I can select the actors for the movie that I want to watch. Right. I mean, that there's an example. Um, you know, maybe it's not uh, as compelling from a, uh, I don't know, uh, from a impact on the world standpoint, uh, but but certainly there's a, an interesting use case. Um, there are other more compelling use cases around individuals who, for instance, lose the ability to speak or communicate in other means where uh, some of these uh, synthetic generation uh, technologies can be uh, can be used to, um, to support them and, and perhaps recover some of their previous capabilities. Um, but certainly, I guess, transitioning a little bit to why this is a problem, that, that bigger epistemic security issue is, is the reason why DARPA as an institution is interested, uh, right? I mean, this has the opportunity to impact, um, you know, our use of information across society writ large certainly could impact the scientific process that might impact DARPA itself. Um, and then how we communicate uh, across uh, communities and uh, nation states, how we communicate within the government uh, or across governments, all of that could be uh, could be impacted uh, by um, by manipulated media. So again, in, in general, that's uh, that's why uh, DARPA is interested in the space. I mentioned during my talk, but I'll I'll repeat here a little bit just in case uh, you know people joined us late. So DARPA is part of the Department of Defense. Uh, we were founded to prevent a strategic surprise, um, and so that's really the driving mission of uh, of DARPA. Uh, again, I'll, I'll refer back to that, you know, epistemic uh, security as part of the reason why uh, DARPA is interested in this space. Um, transitioning to more of a discussion about how DARPA is structured as an agency and, and funding processes, um, we have uh, 
six technology offices. Uh, so I'm in the information innovation office. So that's more core computer science. Uh, these days, it tends to be uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, cyber, uh, information operations. Uh, those, are, those are sort of key areas for us. Uh, there are other uh, offices that are probably relevant to this community. There's a biological technology office. Uh, there is a defense science office. Uh, biological technology office invests in a whole range of things, including messenger RNA vaccines, for which uh, I think all of us are probably very thankful for. Um, and then uh, defense science office uh, that uh, they like to call themselves DARPA's DARPA. Uh, so they're, you know, DARPA is trying to be over the horizon. DSO is trying to be even more forward looking. That means they're also more diverse. So they invest in sort of fundamental mathematics and computer science and social science and, and a range of chemistry and, and other, uh, other investments. Uh, we also have uh, two offices, um, strategic technology, tactical technology offices. Those are more about building DOD specific uh, systems. Uh, and then there's a microsystems technology office that tends to be more uh, electronics focused. So that's, the makeup of the agency in terms of the technical areas uh, that we're in. Um, you know, in terms of um, funding processes and what we look to fund, we're really looking for transformational game changing research. Uh, that's how we address the strategic surprise issues. Um, and so part of the questions that we need to answer as program managers to get a research area funded is, you know, uh, well, really encapsulated in uh, what's called the Heilmeier Catechism. So you can find that on our website. It's a structured set of questions that we have to uh, have to answer that frames how the agency thinks about technical problems. It's things like, you know, what are you trying to do? What's the limits of uh, existing practice? What's new in your idea? Why do you think it'll work? Risks, timeline, how are you going to measure it? Uh, really just sort of fundamental uh, scientific questions, but framed in a way that we just, uh, that we use rigorously. Um, and part of how we need to address those questions is, is being able to explain why DARPA uh, needs to invest in a space. So DARPA is not going to invest in a space where commercial interests are already supporting it, or perhaps where other agencies are already involved. We're really looking for places where there's a nexus of, you know, a strong DOD need and a strong need for transformational uh, research. Uh, and that's the sort of intersection uh, that we might look at uh, for DARPA investments. Um, in terms of the details of how things are funded, so we put out what's called broad agency announcements. Um, so you might think of those as requests for proposals. Uh, technically, they're not because they don't have requirements in them, but uh, they tend to lay out a broad research program. There might be specific technical areas uh, and then Proposed to that, we go through a rigorous uh, proposal review and source selection process. So that's the primary mechanism by which we fund research. Those tend to be large efforts. Um, and then, but there are other mechanisms. Uh, we fund things through small business innovative research um, awards, those SBIR efforts, uh, as, as do much of the US government. We also have uh, smaller efforts now that have been uh, becoming popular that, uh, like our. Um, our AI exploration efforts. Um, so those are meant to be like 18 months, um, maybe even further out, certainly uh, in service to that exploration in their name. And that's us trying to get a sense of, you know, is there something to invest in here? Are there some interesting, uh, compelling capabilities? Um, so those are the general funding mechanisms. Uh, those are all owned by program managers like myself. Um, and then, you know, I know there was a, a question, uh, not in chat today, but in, in some of the prep uh, about, you know, do we fund inter international uh, organizations? Um, and yes, we do. Uh, I, have, uh, I have international organizations as, uh, as researchers on, uh, on some of my efforts. Um, and so, yes, we do, uh, we do fund international uh, uh, researchers. And I see the comment in chat, yes. So, uh, uh, we gave you the internet. I, I think it was originally designed for cats. I'm not 100% sure, um, but it still uh, is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so happy to you know happy to take questions. But I think that gives you a sense of the the structure and and the funding mechanisms for the agency. 
Great. Thank, thanks, Matt. That that was actually very, very enlightening. I, I think um, uh, there there are uh, people in our virtual crowd who who um, probably have ideas which are suitable for DARPA, and um, it, it's it, it's speaking a little bit from experience. It's not as easy to find um, how to how to apply for funding from DARPA as it is uh, NIH. I think I might be biased from where I came from, but that I mean. Still, it's a little bit Byzantine, but um, it's it's a little more accessible. And I think NSF is probably actually the most accessible. And DARPA takes it, it, you need to know how to look. So I appreciate that. And I, on behalf of um, of those in in our uh, virtual audience, yeah. One one tip is uh, so uh, beta.sam.gov is the the new place where that's where a lot of uh, government awards and award notifications are posted. You can set up alerts. Uh, so that's what I did. Before I came to DARPA, I was at a small business. I did work with DARPA and IARPA and other places. You can set up alerts uh, and I would get those every morning and see, you know, hey, did a new program come out? Um, but really the best, uh, the best way is to um, pay attention to who the program managers are in your areas of interest and try and reach out and talk with them. That, that's really the best way to start building the, the connections into the agency. And uh, uh, I'll, well, Mike isn't here, but I'll, I'll say on, on his behalf and also on ORI's behalf, uh, we do have, inter and currently do have uh, international um, grantee or awardees is what we're, we, we're not using the word grantees anymore, we're saying awardees. Um, and uh, when do, does NSF uh, fund um, international or, um, or foreign um, entities? Uh, that's, that's a tricky question. Because in, do we fund foreign entities? Typically not. NSF, as a taxpayer, likes to it gives money to U.S.-based institutions. However, if you are doing work in another country and need to travel there, or need to hire a research assistant, or you know hire, um, you know money is allowable there. So it gets tricky. I.e., we will not give a grant to a foreign entity, but if we give it to a US-based entity who then may be doing some, some contracting or doing some work, but, and that's negotiated. And NSF likes to say, we focus on the science. So if the science needs to be done in Algeria and that's the best place to do it and you can make the case, we will fund you. But if you wanna to go to Algeria just to go to Algeria, no. And um, one thing that Matt reminded me of is that for NSF, the culture is that if you have an idea, whether you want to send it to me or to um, some other um, program, you send a one pager. You put together just a brief description of your project, the intellectual merits, the broader impacts, and you send it to the program officer. And even if it's not the right program officer, they'll be go, oh, I'm not, I can't fund this, but I know a program that will, and they'll put you in contact. So it's a more efficient way to get hold of program officers when you're trying to vet an idea. I, I like to say, um, NSF, um, um, your uh, program directors have uh, superpowers. So, <laughs> so that, that's it's it is a truly. I I like thinking. Uh, I'm envious of of that, and I think that that is an efficient. Uh, it, it's true. It's a very efficient uh, program. Um, so uh, I, see, I see we're starting to get some questions coming in the chat, but I first wanted to uh, pose a, a question uh, to Matt, and there's also, um, I, have, I have one for you as well, Wendy, but first, uh, just to, to build on um, what uh, Matt was saying about uh, how, you know, I think we all know that technology has advanced um, tremendously uh, over the years, and really, it seems like year over year. Um, so, what uh, maybe generally speaking, what obviously knowing that you, where your perspective is from, what, what do you think the biggest threats of research integrity or integrity generally are are coming from? Um, do you think um, science is, uh, is facing technological issues that are you know minor compared to what um, you know these large companies um, or, or even vital utilities or defense companies? Um, are having to to contend with um, what what do you or, and and speaking of that what what 
what can we learn from how uh, how we uh, respond to um, you know on, on the uh, I say like the, the larger scale um, you know from the defense perspective maybe these larger corporations uh, what how is there something that we can scale down or are there maybe some things that we can scale up that um, I think DARPA is in the business of scaling up but are there also some things that you think you've seen that we can sort of scale down and kind of apply some of the apply some of those lessons to science. Is that a question? Ben, was that a question for me or for yes. Linda? Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, yeah. sorry. Um, uh, so, um, you know, the I mean, I guess that's an interesting question in terms of the the scale up, scale down. I would I, I'd argue that sometimes they're the same thing, right? So, you know, uh, think about building technology then that could be broadly used. Uh, that is technology that then might get in the hands of individual users. Um, so, um, so that might be the, uh, I guess, my answer in terms of the the scale down is you know looking for ways to get. Uh, particularly in my case, uh, technological capabilities in the hands of individuals. Um, I will also say uh, that I think, you know, we touched on culture before. I think that's really important. Uh, that's not a place that I'm actively funding research in, but, you know, technical solutions are not the only thing that we need in this space. Uh, I think we do need uh, culture change um, and uh, probably better strategies for doing that. Um, and so I think there's, uh, I think there's certainly a role for that. And again, I would argue that it's the same sort of mechanism. We need to figure out what sort of the right changes are, and then we need to figure out how to distribute them broadly, but it's going to be changes at the individual level, whether that's you know getting access to technical capabilities or changing the mindsets of individuals or, or changing the processes by which we uh, communicate, interact. Okay. Um, and uh, Wenda, um... I actually, I, I, was, I was thinking maybe we, I, we could um, um, start with uh, this uh, question in uh, chat, uh, which is, are there any strategies or policies to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion among grant recipients? Um, what, what are, um, how, how, does that, um, uh, how does that apply to NSF? Yeah, thank you. And I think I'd also add to that and it plays into this one is also mm -hmm. institutional change mm -hmm. because that you know we all know within the university you know scientists pr professors are rewarded on the number of papers and not the quality of papers and if we started stressing quality over quantity would that have an impact on research integrity so there are institutional mechanisms and the, to think about as well and I think that leads into this question where, um, yes, NSF is one of its big 10 ideas is what the abbreviation includes, which is about broadening participation on a really serious way across the STEM fields to really make a difference. And you can look up, there's been a number of different um, grants that have give, been given under the includes heading with one of them being creating networks and alliances to support um, broadening participation. As a program officer um, then re referenced our superpowers. Well, one of our superpowers are to make um, very strategic decisions, i.e. if I have two proposals that have been reviewed really well by the panel. And one is partnering with a minority serving institution and has a really strong plan on promoting diversity or recruiting, um, you know, being very inclusive about its um, strategy for working with students or has an equity plan that's going to rise to the top because there is a value at NSF institutionally to see and to support diversity, inclusion, and equity. There is also a number of programs that if you want to research, what does it mean to be diverse, inclusive um, in a particular community, there's a support to do research to provide better practices. So, that depending on that question, I see a number of different possible answers because 
there is institutional support. There is also the possibility to, as you as a PI, to do innovative work and get funding for that to help the community do it in a stronger manner. Great, thank and, you. Yep. And I should mention there is um, a new initiative out of the social behavioral and economic sciences called Build and Broad. And I believe the deadline is just passed, they're getting in, but that might be um, a place to look for um, funding, particularly that's with an emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'll build and broad. I'll look for the website and put it in. Okay. So, um, and as for for uh, the crowd, if if um, if you have uh, questions, please um, please put them in chat. Um, and in the um, uh, in the meantime, I have my own questions. It's it, I I think you know there there's uh, I, I guess it's a recurring recurring theme. There's there's um, uh, there's the there's the the person people element on the one hand in terms of education, and then there's the the um, uh, the machine and thing uh, element on the other end. I, I'd say, or maybe this isn't a continuum where there's technology and there's education. Um, and I, I wonder, um, really, this is more sort of a um, broad thought question in terms of uh, where, where it, is there, uh, it, this was prompted actually when, from what you were saying in terms of the a quality versus quantity question, where on the one hand, how, how, how do you assess uh, quality? Are, are there certain metrics? And, and I think there are certain metrics, for example, um, you know, citations or whatnot, and we find that people try to gain, try to gain that system. The question is then, it made me think of that the person element. So someone has a hundred papers, is a tenure committee gonna actually uh, read them or read any of them and and um, and then say, well, you know, these are the three best or, or look at a hundred publications or let's say look at a hundred publications and say, none of these are really worth much. Then look at maybe someone with with five and say three of these five are, are groundbreaking or this one is, is groundbreaking um, and it is, I, that's where I, I wonder, considering how many universities are, how many professors are, less tenured professorships, but that's a separate issue. Uh, but with with all these tenure committees and all these papers, how how would we? I guess that that sort of gets to the whole issue of um, of of the the people and the technology and 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 so that's why I, I wonder where 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 is that? Um, you know, it, is are those are those uh, comp, you know, I complementary it's really something I wrestle with it's it's because we you know or I does RCR education we also fund grants we fund you know technology based grants such as a uh, uh, number of Daniels um, and and others as well um, and and so I I, I wonder I, I feel like it's it's an all of the above approach but is is there you know from uh, and you know it's not just for you but also for Matt as well just sort, sort of some thoughts on on um, on where, you know, is, is there a boundary between, you know, the people and the thing, the education and technology, or how, how, do, you, how do you see that, um, that ecosystem evolving? And this again is where I fall back on culture. I mean, the culture is a complex and it involves the people, it involves the institutions, it involves the things that oftentimes when I used to teach science, um, kind of introduction of science and technology studies, my favorite thing to pick on was the chair because we, we don't think of it, but you know, how many of us have complained because of all the you know, Zoom meetings that you know, we're just you know, we're, we're, you know, sitting in a chair looking and how that shapes just our, our worldview, our, what our body is experiencing. So, but it's thinking, you know, things are important in the culture, but that's, I'm digressing. But that it's, the culture is really complex and it's dynamic and it's living. And you're exactly right. The question of, do you choose quality over quantity? Well, it's, you know, it, as humans, we're always figuring out in between because go compare somebody in your field 50 years ago who got tenure after six years and then look at, you know, the last 20 years or 30 years, the last five years, 
and that anecdotally, I would assume most of us that would agree that the bar keeps being moved higher and it's shifting. And sometimes, and this is where I really like thinking about ethical and values, is to have a moment to stop and say, well, is this what we want to continue to do? If the trend is to continue to raise the bar on individuals to get tenure, is that the culture that we want to continue to perpetuate? Or do we need to start thinking, because like COVID has helped us think through this, of, well, maybe we need to have some conditions and understanding, especially for some of the academics with young children, to think about, oh, we need to change and have special considerations. But it really comes back to the idea of the community coming together and talking about all of these and, and weighing those pros and cons of, you know, the individual stresses, the institutional, the global, the health issues, and even the material culture of the chairs and the computer and, you know, the internet that we're using to think about how it's creating this culture rather than just to always be responding to the culture, to take those moments to ask those value-laden questions, those ethical questions to think about, wait a minute, what can we, can we do an intervention? Can we change this? Is this what we want? And Matt, I think uh, I, it's, it's uh, the earlier um, mention of the internet, I think is, is a great actually um, uh, sort of, is think about all the great things that have come from the internet and also think of all of like the terrible things. And since we're talking about people with kids and as, as, some, as a parent of three young kids, uh, there's a lot about it that's horrible, but you know, there are also uh, some things, you know, the last year of virtual schooling, for example, uh, there, there are, um, you know, it, it's, it's in, the, in the hand, it's a tool in the hands of, of people with values. So, uh, um, so anyway, that, this is my editorial uh, comment, which, which uh, I, I think um, is relevant, I hope. So uh, I was wondering what your thoughts to- Yeah, I mean, uh, I would agree a lot of these uh, technologies, internet might be one, media generation, media uh, uh, manipulation technologies, these are sort of dual use technologies, right? They've got positive applications, they've got negative applications. Um, and so, you know, maybe to Wenda's point about the, the role of culture, maybe by shaping the culture, we can sort of prioritize certain uses, uh, things that we decide are positive use cases versus, uh, versus others. Um, I guess going back uh, more broadly to, you know, our opportunity to, let's say, shape the culture as, uh, as program managers or as funding institutions, you know, we generally have quite a bit of latitude, as Wenda uh, described, to you know, uh, figure out what, uh, what is most attractive about a particular proposal or a set of proposals. And, and you know, uh, there, is, there is room to, to take into account uh, sort of different perspectives and how we're deciding to fund, uh, fund a particular effort. So, um, you know, for instance, uh, I use uh, what I'll colloquially call the convening power of DARPA oftentimes, right? So when I run a principal investigator meeting, I will invite people outside the program. That's an opportunity for me to connect together the research base, folks that I'm funding directly, and also people that I'm not necessarily funding directly. Uh, I think that's particularly important in the spaces that I'm working in, uh, let's say around media manipulation, because you know, there is not one entity, there is not one institution that's going to make this sort of problem go away. And so I'm strongly in favor of trying to build collaborative, uh, you know, structures, collaborative societal structures uh, to deal with that. That might be putting research teams together, that might be putting together, uh, you know, social media platforms with researchers that have defensive technologies. Uh, that's certainly an opportunity that I try and take advantage of at DARPA is that ability to bring disparate uh, groups together. Maybe it's disparate uh, technical points of view or you know, one uh, needs a technology and another has it. Um, but you know, again, those are opportunities I think that we can take advantage of as, uh, as program managers uh, to have a, an influence on the culture and, uh, and on society. 
Okay, thanks. Um, I, I'm I'm looking at the time. I, I see that we we have a, a question, but if if that's okay with um, with um, with Matt and and Wenda, I was I was thinking maybe that's something that we can uh, potentially um, um, we can potentially cir circulate that that question. I think it's a, it's a great question, but I, I know that we're we're now mid over and and um, um, uh, we're we're. Daniel's running a tight ship. I, I want to keep us on course here. So if if it's okay, we'll we'll um, we'll maybe get some. Uh, um, I'll circulate the question. It looks like there's another one, um, uh, and uh, maybe post responses that way. If that's okay with uh, if that'll work, and um, I, I hopefully uh, uh, I'm I'm I know that that uh, Mike is a busy person, but hopefully he'll he'll be able to as well. Um, and uh, I'll I'll um uh, I'll I'll put Daniel on that. So he'll 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 ensure uh, he'll he'll ensure compliance on on uh, Dr. Lauer's part. So uh, I want to thank you on behalf of 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 ORI and and well I, I don't know if I can speak for Daniel, but just on, uh, convey my appreciation. I think this was a very um, very enlightening um, uh, panel, and I think it also validates my. Um, uh, uh, for those of us who 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 have who, who have uh, um, the social scientists among us who have who have seen where culture and technology the nexus of culture and technology, uh, it, at least for me it validates a lot of my uh, my educational career choice. So I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, so let me um, uh, let me um, uh, pitch it back to to Daniel who who will introduce our next next session. So so again. Uh, Dr. Turek, Dr. Bauschbees, thank you very much for uh, joining us and for uh, telling us uh, about your, your agencies, not just what you do, but how, how we can do it with you. So thank you.